As we continue in our verse-by-verse study of the Apostle Paul's second letter to Timothy, we come to chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Leading up to this text, the Apostle had reminded Timothy about what his ministry should look like, and that it was to be marked by sacrifice, self-discipline, and self-denial. Paul also recognized that wearied Timothy was, was really down and, and needed a new, fresh spark and a new desire to continue to press on for the sake of the gospel. And as such, he reveals these three things to help reinvigorate Timothy now and throughout the entirety of his ministry. First, to keep his focus upon Jesus, his person, his path, his promise. Secondly, to remind him of the fight that we share in Christian ministry. And thirdly, of the faith that we have. So let's listen as Pastor Marvin Knight unfolds this text in today's message titled, How to Endure a Difficult Ministry. Thank you for being in your place. I trust that you have your Bible, so would you take your copy of the Scriptures and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. This morning, the message is entitled, How to Endure a Difficult Ministry. Now, the title might, might suggest that this is a message only for pastors or those in ministry, but rather this is a message for every Christian who has been given a ministry, a ministry to serve Christ in this world, and finds it difficult, whether that's a ministry of the gospel in your home, or the ministry of the gospel at your work, or in the church. The message that we find here in this text will help us understand how to endure a difficult ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll begin our reading in verse 8, and we'll read down through verse 10. Let's come to the Word of God together. Verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it, eternal glory, eternal glory. Let's pray. Father, we ask now in Jesus' name for grace to understand, grace to preach, grace to comprehend, grace to obey. We thank you that in Christ we find all the grace that we need to do your will. May that grace be ours in this hour. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I want to begin this message with a personal question. Don't answer out loud. Just answer it deep within your soul and in your conscience. How is it with your soul today? How is it with your soul today? Are you uh, discouraged in life? Or are you encouraged in Christ? How is it with your soul today? Someone has written... More people fail in life because of a lack of encouragement more than any other reason. 
Now, disappointment will often come in your life and in mine by looking at others. And disheartening will come in your life from looking at yourself for too long. But if you wish to be encouraged, if you, if you wish to be strengthened, if you wish to be lifted, the Scottish pastor Robert Murray McShane said, for every one look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. The calling of this text is to remember Jesus Christ. It's to look at Jesus Christ, to consider Christ, to meditate and to think about Christ. John Newton said, a single view of Jesus Christ will do you more good than pouring over your own wounds for an entire month. Just one single view of Christ. These words were written to Timothy in the context of a difficult ministry. The fire of passion within his soul was beginning to shrink. His flame was flickering. His walk was on the verge of faltering. Timothy had become beaten down by the demands of serving Christ. Has this been the case with you? He had become timid in his ministry. He was on the verge of becoming ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. And I wonder if this is the case with any of you today. Timothy, Paul says, needed to kindle afresh the gift of God within him. And perhaps you need to do the same. You need a fresh spark. You need a, a renewed desire. And as Paul wrote to Timothy, he was at a very low point in his life. No servant of Jesus is immune from the dark valleys from which they might serve Christ. None of us. Timothy was weakening in his convictions. Timothy was, was weakening in his commitment. Timothy was weakening in his courage. And the question that he faced was, how could he turn it around? How, how would he rebound spiritually? How would he be restored to this full robust Bust, enthusiastic zeal of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. In these few verses, Paul writes to lift the spirit of Timothy. And if you give me your attention today and you give your attention to the word of God, God will by his power and grace inject a dose of spiritual encouragement into your veins so that you might be restored to serving Christ with zeal and fervency and enthusiasm. There are three main headings that are seen in our text. The first thing we discover in verse 8 is the focus, the focus we need. In verse 9, we discover the fight, the fight that we share. In verse 10, we discover the faith, the faith that we have. The focus, the fight, the faith. And the main target that the Apostle Paul is aiming at in these words is this. With your eyes fixed on Jesus, you can endure a difficult ministry and mature in your faith in Christ. Let's come now to our text. As we think about the context just for a moment, we recall that what's on Paul's mind is seen in the context of verses 1 through 7. 
Uh, we looked at that last week. A, a cursory preview or review would help us to recall what Paul is thinking about. He called upon Timothy to be a good soldier of Christ Jesus in verse 4, a disciplined athlete in verse 5, and a hard-working farmer in verse 6. This is all chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In other words, he reminded Timothy of what a soldier must do. What must a soldier do? A soldier must take his share of the suffering. A soldier must have self-sacrifice. He reminded him of an athlete. And as an athlete, he must sacrifice, but run according to the rules in order to gain the victory. He reminded him of a farmer, a hard-working farmer. And what must a farmer do? A farmer must have self-denial. He must toil, he must work in service to Christ or to God and trust, trust the Lord for the outcome. And so Paul reminds Timothy that three things are needed if you're going to avoid apostasy, self-sacrifice, self-discipline, and self-denial. Now as we come to verse 8, Paul tells Timothy clearly, if you'll look at your, the Word of God, he says, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. Why, Paul? Why do I need to remember Jesus Christ? Because, you see, Jesus was the greatest soldier to ever engage in spiritual warfare. Jesus was the one who entered into this cosmic conflict context in order to win rebels who had sinned against him. We need to remember Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ was the greatest athlete who ever entered into the race. And he kept the rules more than anyone else seeking to do the will of God. We must remember Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus was the most hard-working farmer who ever put his hand to the plow in ministry. And it is said of Jesus, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God in victory. Remember Jesus Christ, Paul said. He is reflecting on our supreme model for ministry. With that in mind, we begin in verse 8. Here's the focus we need. Here's the focus we need. Let's back it up a couple of slides. Here's the focus we need. Verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, a descendant of David, according to my gospel. The message of verse 8 is what? Stay focused on Jesus. That's the message. Don't ever take your eyes off him. Don't ever forget the Lord. Fight spiritual amnesia. Now, what does it mean to remember the Lord? What does it mean? And what specifically do we need to remember about him that will bring encouragement to our souls? Well, the Greek word for remember there in verse 8 means to, to call something to mind, to call information to your mental apprehension so that it would guide your actions. Uh, the same word is actually used by Jesus himself at the Lord's Supper when he told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. The same idea is found in Hebrews 12 too, where the writer calls the readers to fix, to fix their eyes on Jesus. And then verse 3 says, consider him. That is to say, to meditate on who he is, to think about what he has done, to contemplate his person, to hold his very person in your thoughts. 
It means to turn your attention to the preeminent one who deserves all of our focus. You can think of it like this. Think of it like an art gallery, an art gallery in your mind. We all have pictures in our minds, in our heads, and as you stroll through that mental art gallery, there are some pictures on the walls that need to be taken down. I mean, they're just not good pictures. They're unholy pictures. They're unrighteous pictures. They're pictures of shame, and you need to take those pictures down by faith and put up new ones. But there are other pictures that need to be meditated on. But the image that deserves the, the, the most attention is this image that should occupy the most significant amount of space in your mind. It has the golden frame around it. And it's the picture of Jesus. Paul says, now, stop. Stop. As you walk through that gallery, stop at that picture, that picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and meditate on him. Now you say, why, why should we do this? Why do we need to do this? We ought to remember the Lord as an act of loving obedience. The word remember here in verse 8 appears in the imperative mood. It is a command, actually. It is not a suggestion. It is a divine order. It is God saying to us through the apostle, Remember, my son. It is a command in the present tense, which means that we are to keep on remembering. And so this is to be our practice. We are to keep him on our mind. Keep them on our minds. Now, Paul is not calling Timothy to depend upon some great memory, but what he is doing is he is saying, remember and enjoy the personal presence of a living and great Savior. And keep Jesus in your thoughts all day long. All day long. You say, Pastor, how do we do that practically? Because my day is so filled with so many things and my mind is all over the place and I get so discouraged as we walk through life and I'm just distracted with this and that. How do we do this? Thank you for asking. We do this by keeping before us the example of Jesus. The example of Jesus. We're not to try to look at some mental picture of Jesus in our mind and just gaze on it and act as if we have nothing else to do. But we are to remember now his example. And when you're given a task that you feel like is beyond you, you must remember there's one who is with you. One who is with you who cannot be defeated. There's one who is with you when fears threaten and when doubts assail, when inadequacies, inadequacies depress. Remember the presence of the risen Lord in your life. That he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you that he is with you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember the risen Lord. You ought to remember his, his life, remember his ministry, remember his sacrifice, remember his commitment, remember his death, remember everything that you can about the Lord and what it will do is it will strengthen you. It will strengthen and encourage and lift and build your spirit. This is the go-to direction Paul gives to, the right, to, to Timothy. It's the go-to direction that the writer of the Hebrews gave to those Hebrews who were on the verge of capitulating and going back. And the writer of Hebrews continues to say, no, don't turn away. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep focused on him. Don't forget what you have been taught. 
but I hear someone saying, Pastor, what, again, what should I remember about Jesus? And Paul answers this question for us, actually, in verse 8, and he gives us three specifics. Three specifics. The first thing that we are to do is that we are to remember his person. See it in the text? Remember Jesus Christ. This verse is the only time Paul uses the order Jesus before Christ. He usually says Christ Jesus, but here he draws attention to the fact that the man Jesus who walked on this earth suffered opposition and death, was revealed in his resurrection to be the Christ. The Christ. He has been shown to be the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy. Remember his person. Remember that this Christ, this Jesus, is our actual life. He's our life. But remember also, number two, his path. Remember his path. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Now, since he was raised, that implies what? That he died. That he was laid low in the grave of death and then was raised to life. The word risen here is in the perfect tense, which marks it as a permanent condition. Raised and still living. Raised and never to die again. Raised forever. This is the Jesus that we are to remember. Raised and lifted up, seated on the throne the risen Lord and Savior. John MacArthur has said it well. He said Jesus' path to the crown glory was marked by pain before pleasure. It was marked by sorrow before joy, humiliation before glorification, persecution before exaltation, death before resurrection, earthly hatred before heavenly worship. As we think of Jesus, now raised, now raised, all of the sorrows of this life past him in that sense. Let this encourage you as you bear your trial. Remember how Jesus suffered in obscurity? Remember when it looked like he was defeated from a human perspective? Remember when he was chased from town to town, as it were? Paul is saying to Timothy, remember that although it was dark and gloomy and difficult and that Jesus himself was met with resistance and opposition and unbelief and betrayal, remember, remember, young fella, that God did not leave his son in the grave. That God raised him to life. Remember, Timothy, when the crowd cheered on Friday. Remember, Timothy, when the demons danced on Saturday. Remember, Timothy, that early Sunday morning, God raised him from the dead. Never to die again. Remember your Savior when it gets dark. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that lives in you and in me. And just as God raised his son to life and had the last word in his life, God will have the last word in your life. He will have the last word. Yes, remember Jesus Christ. Remember his person. Remember his path. But also remember his promise. Remember Jesus Christ. Notice verse 8. Risen from the dead. Descendant of David. That description there stresses 
the flesh and blood humanity of Jesus Christ. You see, it was in his humanity that he suffered. It was in his humanity that he was tempted. It was in his, uh, in his earthly life that he was antagonized and attacked. But despite his bloody death, despite his rejection by men, despite the antagonism by the religious leaders, you know who he was? He was God's appointed heir. Despite his suffering, God rewarded him with the rightful status of not only heaven's king, but earth's king. And the vast promises of the Davidic covenant were his. God did not leave his son unrewarded and neither will he leave you unrewarded if you believe in him. For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Wherefore through him is our amen to the glory of God the Father. You know, one of my uh, secret ambitions, it's, it's, I don't know where I got it from, but I, it's a, on my bucket list. You know, we all have bucket lists, I think. It's to race in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, not, not, of course, to run, but to ride, you know. I, I uh, you know... I, you wouldn't have known that if I didn't tell you, but I, it's just one of those things that I can imagine myself sitting on that rider, or on that horse, and just, you know, focused on the, on the prize there. I mean, those horses can get up and go. Did you know that one of the secrets of, of any horse finishing the race and doing well is these blinders that they put on their eyes? It, it's... it's they're put there not to obscure their entire vision, but to, to block their peripheral vision so that they can focus on two things, the voice of the writer and the finish line. And what Paul is saying here is that we need these horse blinders. We need these things to help us to just listen to the voice of our king and focus on the finish line and, and to stay focused on Jesus Christ so that as we run and we get tired and weary, we don't give up and we keep pressing toward that line and pressing toward that line and pressing toward that line knowing that Jesus is giving us the strength that we need to finish. You and I need to know that in every hardship and every affliction, that we can remember him. In preaching and in teaching and in unjust suffering and mounting opposition, even when you're lonely, dear friends, and you're by yourself and nobody seems to care, when you're weak and you feel like I can't go on, you can remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David. Never forget it. This is the focus we need. Now Paul moves to the fight that we share. The fight that we share. Notice now verse 9. The word for there is a term of explanation. It's like a, a connector term that latches us on to the next verse. And it tells us something that we need to know. And Paul says, verse 9, for which I suffer hardship even to the point or even to imprisonment as a criminal, notice verse 9, but the word of God is not in prison. Now the word for which, the words for which in verse 9 actually point us back to the gospel at the end of verse 8. It is the antecedent for the pronoun, if you'll notice, for which, in other words, for the gospel, I suffer hardship. 
even to the point of imprisonment as a criminal. Now, what is Paul doing? Track with me now. Paul is describing his difficulty, and he reminds Timothy of the enormous price to be paid as a servant of the gospel. He suffers what? Verse 9. Hardship. Hardship for what? For the gospel he preached. And what was the cost? Verse 9. Imprisonment as a criminal. And soon after that, it would be at the expense of his life. Now, the imprisonment that is referred to here in verse 9 is his second imprisonment. The first Roman imprisonment took place where he wrote the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And then he was released from his first Roman imprisonment and continued his travels until here at the end he is apprehended, taken to Rome, and now he is suffering his second imprisonment. And while in prison, some things were taking place. There was a smearing of his name taking place. People were now ashamed of Paul. And that's why he had to tell Timothy uh, to not be ashamed of him. They were saying that Paul was a criminal. He was a criminal. Notice he adds some details for us in verse 9 even to imprisonment as a criminal. And the word imprisonment there actually means to be in chains, to be in chains, in bonds, in shackles. Paul was not just put in a cell, uh, some room, and you know, just said, okay, you stay here, but he was put in stocks and bonds. The point that he is making here to Timothy is, Timothy, there is a sacrifice that's demanded as you serve the Lord. Timothy, you're going to be met with much resistance, but Timothy, don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. If we suffer for the gospel, don't get caught off guard, Timothy, and start wondering, am I doing the right thing? What's wrong with me? Did I make a misstep? Don't start questioning, Timothy, why you're going through this. This should be expected as a servant of Jesus. It is at this point that we need to do a heart check right now. And we need to ask ourselves, what are we suffering for Jesus' sake? Some of us are not suffering anything because we're not speaking up for his name's sake. We're not living for his name's sake. And we must remember that the Christian life is not a luxury cruise ship that we get on to sail around life and enjoy pleasures. But the Christian life is a battleship. And we step onto that battleship And there are dangers on every side. And as we serve the Lord, there will be storms ahead. There will be resistance that we face. But the more we advance in serving Jesus Christ, the greater the fight will become, and it may even lead to suffering, imprisonment, the firing from your job, The abandonment from your friends. The ostracism and ridicule from your family. If you really want to understand what Paul has gone through for Jesus' sake, we just can't skip past thinking about what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's look at this briefly just to support this point about this fight that Paul was in and the suffering that he faced. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, actually beginning in verse 23. Let me just set this text in its context real, real, real briefly for you here. Uh, this is one of the only times where Paul is actually cataloging his sufferings. And he puts it all into this one section. In this one section because he wants us to understand the hardships that he suffered in 
serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the background is that the, there are false teachers and, and false accusations that's being leveled at Paul, and it's coming through the Corinthian church. My family was having a discussion about this, how in this world, people can just throw accusations at you, and people just believe it. They don't even ask for the facts. They just believe whatever accusations come out. Well, accusations were just flying through the Corinthian church at the Apostle Paul, and it placed him in this awkward position of having to defend himself. Paul's appeal as a faithful servant of the Lord to the point to suffering to the Corinthians was made clear. And here's his reasoning. Stay with me now. Here's his reasoning. A false teacher... A false servant would never go through the deep waters of suffering. No, no, no. What he will do is he'll pack his bags and he'll hit the ground running. He'll look for a much easier place. Only a genuine servant of the Lord, only a genuine follower will endure. Only a genuine servant will persevere. So this is how Paul defends his apostleship. Beginning in verse 23. Watch it now. Are they servants of Christ? They speaking of the false teachers. I speak as if insane. I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. That's a summary of all the hardship he suffered, and now he's going to, to launch into this, some specifics, a punch list, if you will, of the things that he endured for Jesus Christ. Watch this, verse 24. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. According to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 1 through 3, the law of God said that no one could receive more than 40 lashes. Why? Because it would kill a man. And what Paul is telling us here is this. I was brought to the doorstep of death five times. I was whipped within an inch of my life. What false servant would endure this? Verse 25, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. You remember where that happened? In Acts chapter 14 at Lystra. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent in the deep. Meaning he was in one of those shipwrecks which was so severe that Paul had to cling to a piece of wood out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea all night, all day, until someone came and fished him out. All of this so that he can go from point A to point B to preach the gospel. Verse 26, I have been on frequent journeys, dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. You see, every one of those dangers was a life-threatening danger. Where Paul was on the brink of passing from time into eternity. He was within an eyelash of death. Verse 27, I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Verse 28, apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. 
This is what accompanies ministry, people. To serve the Lord Jesus Christ may not push us to these heroic limits. We have been given a much easier path to run. But like Timothy, we must remember this. Write this down in capital letters. That a ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. Ministry that costs you nothing accomplishes nothing. It is only as we are involved in fighting the good fight, making personal sacrifices, expending ourselves for the ministry of the gospel, that the ministry accomplishes much in the name of the Lord. And so I want to ask you, what sacrifice is the Lord asking of you in the service of Christ? I want to ask you, what inconvenience is the Lord asking you to take in order to change your schedule or to recalibrate your priorities so that you can serve Christ in new ways? Let's be honest. On Wednesday night, often, there's not some uh, absolute necessary thing that's keeping you from getting, getting here on Wednesday to pray. It's just the inconvenience of making your way through traffic. We are saved to serve. And such service will always come at a price. It'll cost you some time. It'll cost you some energy. It'll cost you some treasures. But listen, when we go through those difficulties for Jesus' sake, what happens is that our resolve in Jesus grows and our faith deepens and the intimacy of Christ It's deeper and deeper and deeper. So Paul says, Timothy, what your focus is, your focus is Jesus Christ. But there's a fight that you're in. And you must realize that it's going to cost you something. Then he closes. He closes with, this is the faith that we have, Timothy. Timothy. This is the faith that we have in Christian ministry. In the middle of verse 9, Paul uses a conjunction that shifts our attention. I'd like you to notice it carefully now. Verse verse 9. For which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not in prison. What is Paul telling Timothy? He is telling Timothy this. Timothy, we have faith in God's invincible word. What Paul is explaining here is that although he is suffering and the messenger may be thrown into the slammer, the message cannot be locked up. It can't be shut down. The preacher may be in chains, but the gospel will never be bound. The servant of the Lord may be incarcerated, but never the scripture. The word of God will never be stopped. It will never be overthrown. The word of God is invincible, unconquerable. It is unimpeachable. No enemy can thwart it. No government can tame it. It will triumph. And when one servant goes down, God will raise up ten more. That's what Paul is reminding Timothy of here. We are reminded of this when we hear the words of Martin Luther's hymn. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, 
we will not fear. For God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word will fail him. That word, above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours. Through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom. Oh, I wish somebody would get happy in here. His kingdom abideth, endureth forever. Remember, Timothy is burdened. He's down. He feels hemmed in by his circumstances. Some of you feel that way right now. He says, Timothy, remember, God's word is not bound. God's word can't be locked up, Timothy. Remember, Timothy, God's word can't be in prison. It will accomplish what concerns us. So we must have faith in what? God's invincible word. But secondly, we must have faith in something else. God's immutable election. Look at how Paul puts it here in verse 10. For this reason, watch it now. I endure all things for the sake of those who are what? Chosen. I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. For what reason, Paul? For what reason? Because God's word is invincible. It cannot be stopped. It cannot be in prison. For this reason. For this reason. Because God's word can't be stopped. Timothy, I'm enduring. I'm pressing on. I'm persevering. I endure what? All things. Not some things. All things. Whatever the devil throws at me. Whatever the world throws at me. Whatever the family and the difficulties may arise before me, health issues, family issues, finance issues, I endure all things. What would inject such faith and confidence in the Lord? Paul tells us right here in the verse. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. Paul says, here it is. The reason I endure is the doctrine of sovereign unconditional election. The doctrine of election was the very cornerstone in Timothy's life, and it is to be in ours. It was the cornerstone in Paul's life. Paul says, you can build your life upon it. I'm not speaking. I'm not speaking of some presidential election. We're talking about God's election. This is the doctrine taught throughout Scripture. What does it teach? It teaches that from the foundation of the world... Before we had done anything good or bad, before works were performed, before your ethnicity and gender was determined, God, in eternity past, chose those whom he would save. And it is the guarantee that they will come to faith in Jesus Christ. He said, Pastor, that sounds a lot like predestination. I would say, you're right. You're right. Because the scripture says that God has not only ordained the end, but he has predetermined the means to get every person to that end. And he will get them there. Everyone who is saved will, or everyone who is elect, will come to Christ. And there's not enough demons in hell 
or outside of hell that will keep them from coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way in Romans 8, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also what? Glorified. Ephesians 1, 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Paul is gripped with this conviction that God has selected and predestined the salvation of individuals before time began and no storm, no difficulty, no challenge in ministry will prevent them from coming to Christ. God's purposes will come to pass. He said, Pastor, I don't see how this is going to help me right now. Well, think about how it helped Paul. You remember there he's, uh, he's in Acts chapter 18. He's, he goes into a synagogue. He, he reasons from the scripture. They throw him out. There He's ready to shake the dust off his feet and go to another town. God appears to him in a vision. He says, don't be afraid. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. I am with you. No man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. They hadn't come to Christ yet. But God said, they're mine, and I'm going to bring them. Do you know what this means? This means that there are people all in South Phoenix. There are people all in Central Phoenix, all in North Phoenix, all in Chandler, Tempe, Peoria. There are people, God's people, all around us. We don't know who they are, but they are God's. And God calls us to come with the gospel and preach it and he will use that gospel to draw them to himself and they will come. Every single one of them will come. Are you going to keep back the gospel? I hope not. God has a bride and he will call his bride to himself and this should kick our evangelism into overdrive. So notice what Paul says as we bring this message to a close in verse 10. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that, now notice his language carefully, they may also, who is the they, the chosen, may obtain salvation. And where is that salvation? It is in Christ. It is not in church. It is in Christ. It is not in baptism. It is in Christ. It is not in your good works. It is in Christ. And so in order for you to have salvation, you must find the righteousness that is in Christ. You must get to Jesus. All redemption is in Christ. For there's no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. All righteousness that we need is in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's an exclusivity of salvation in Jesus Christ alone. It's not in Jesus and church. It's not in Jesus and in your works. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ alone. And Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus said, I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death 
and Hades, which means that the moment God wants to take your life, he can, but he also has the authority to keep it alive, and every moment that he keeps you alive, he's giving you a chance to trust, to look, to love, to obey, to follow, because he has the authority. And every morning, and every moment that he allows us to breathe, it's a grace given by Jesus to serve him, to know him. I hear someone saying, Pastor, I, you know, I know I should come to Christ, but my motives are, are not right. My motives, you know, I, they're not where they need to be. Listen, is your motive to have life? If your motive is to have life, then come to Jesus. Jesus said that he who believes in him would be saved. He said, Pastor, I, I, I just don't want to come right now because I feel like I'm going to fail. Adam failed. Christ succeeded. Through Adam's disobedience, we all became sinners. Through the obedience of Christ, you can be made righteous. He said, Pastor, I know I should come, but my heart is so cold. My heart is so indifferent. I don't feel it. I hear people say that all the time. I don't feel it in my heart. Aren't you tired of being without power and out, without purpose? Aren't you tired of that nagging voice in your conscience? Aren't you, aren't you tired of that emptiness that you feel in your heart? If so, and come to Jesus. You said, Pastor, maybe it's too late for me. Maybe it's just I've waited too long. Don't forget the thief. At the 11th hour, he came to Jesus. And Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. That man was fastened to a cross. He, was, he was, had the last breaths of life in his lungs. And he looked to Jesus Jesus saved him. It's never too late. And when you do come to Jesus, he won't give you salvation for a moment. Paul describes it at the end of this text. With this salvation in Jesus is eternal glory, which means that it lasts forever. It lasts forever. When God chose us in Christ, he will keep us in Christ, he will secure us, and there are no dropouts in God's family. No one will slip through the cracks. So in the darkest times, when you feel like you're at the end of yourself, remember Jesus Christ. Remember that underneath your life and underneath your ministry is the invincible word of God. And that word will never go down. It will never be imprisoned. And God will save the elect and keep them for eternity. This is the focus we have. This is the fight we share. This is the faith we have. This is gospel encouragement, people. So rearrange the picture gallery in your mind, okay? Stop concentrating on those pictures that are temporary and sinful or shameful. Stop concentrating on those pictures and concentrate on the most significant image and picture in your mind of Jesus Christ and his work. And then pre-decide. Pre-decide, I'm going to take God at his word. If God said it, that settles it. Believe it or not. And I'm going to choose to believe the word. Even when everything in my flesh is saying something different. Let's pray together.
Only your word, Lord, could humble us to the dust so that we are looking up to Jesus and Jesus alone. Only your word can give us the answers for the difficulties we face. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you so much that you didn't give us some superficial answer, but that this, your answer, applies to every believer in your family. Lord, if there are things that are distracting our focus, we ask that you would show that to us. By the Spirit's power, help us to look to Christ and keep fighting the fight of faith until you come again. In Jesus' name.